I've come to 2 Samuel 5, and I'll just admit to you, as I was reading through chapters 3, 4, and 5, and uh, looking at the life of David and how these stories uh, relate to David, I, I really landed in, in chapter 5 here, because although David's involved in some of the things in the previous chapter, chapter 4, it's in a, in a somewhat of a minute, a minute way, and I'll refer to those things tonight, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take what we're going to read tonight and uh, make an application to what's happening in the life of David here. Uh, I've, in, I've really, really, and I've said this again and again, and I, and I mean it, I, I've enjoyed, I always enjoy studying a character, you know, and uh, following his life and seeing what he goes through, and, uh, and I realize that uh, even the finest of men need the Lord, Amen. and even the finest of men make mistakes, and uh, thank God uh, for his grace that uh, the key to it is not that we don't make the mistake, although we strive for that. It's what we do when, when we make the mistake, how we handle it, and how we respond to it. Amen. And of course, David uh, always has responded, although sometimes it took him a little while, uh, as we'll see later with the sin with Bathsheba uh, coming up in a few chapters, uh, he always turned back to the Lord. Amen. And uh, so we're at 2 Samuel 5, and uh, what I'd like to do is I'd le like to read portions of this chapter uh, we'll read verses 1 through 12, and then we'll jump down to verse 17. So if you're able to stand, let's stand together. Help me out. Let's read responsively tonight. I'll read verse 1, and then we'll go on from there. Verse 1 of 2 Samuel 5. Then came all the tribes of Israel to David unto Hebron, and spake, saying, Behold, we are thy bone and thy flesh. Also in time past, when Saul was king over us, that was he that led us out and brought us in Israel. And the Lord said to thee, Thou shalt feed my people Israel, and thou shalt be a captain over Israel. So all the elders of Israel came to the king to Hebron. And King David made a league with them in Hebron before the Lord. And they anointed David king over Israel. Amen. David was 30 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 40 years. In Hebron, he reigned over Judah seven years and six months. And in Jerusalem, he reigned 30 and three years over all Israel and Judah. And the king and his men went to Jerusalem unto the Jebusites, the inhabitants of the land, which spake unto David, saying, Except thou take away the blind and the lame, Thou shalt not come in hither, thinking David cannot come in hither. Nevertheless, David took the stronghold of Zion. The same is the city of David. And David said on that day, Whosoever getteth up to the gutter, and smiteth the Jebusites, and the lame and the blind, that are hated of David's soul, he shall be chief and captain. Wherefore they said, The blind and the lame shall not come into the house. So David dwelt in the fort and called it the city of David. And David built round about from Milo and inward. And David went on and grew great. And the Lord God of hosts was with him. And Hiram king of Tyre sent messengers to David, and cedar trees and carpenters and masons, and they built David an house. And David perceived that the Lord had established him king over Israel, and that he exalted his kingdom for his people Israel's sake. Now let's go over to verse 17, and I'll read that, and we'll read down to verse 25 in the same fashion. But when the Philistines heard that they had anointed David king over Israel, all the Philistines came up to seek David, and David heard of it, and went down to the hold. The Philistines also came, spread themselves in the valley of Rephaim. And David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go up to the Philistines? Wilt thou deliver them into mine hand? The Lord said unto David, Go up, for I will doubtless deliver the Philistines into thine hand. And David came to baal Perazim, and David smote them there, and said, the Lord hath broken forth upon mine enemies before me as the breach of waters. Therefore he called the name of that place Baal-perazim. There they left their images 
and David and his men burned them. And the Philistines came up yet again and spread themselves in the valley of Rephim. And when David inquired of the Lord, he said, Thou shalt not go up, but fetch a compass behind them and come upon them over against the mulberry trees. And let it be when thou hearest the sound of a going in the tops of the mulberry trees that they stir thyself, for then shall the Lord go out before thee to smite the host of the Philistines. And David did so as the Lord had commanded him, Amen. and smote the Philistines from Geba until thou come to Gezer. Amen. Well, we'll stop there. A lot happens in that, in that chapter. And uh, Lord willing, I'll be able to address that tonight. So let's pray. Father, thank you again for your word. Thank you for the life of David Amen. and the things that we learn from it. And Lord, I pray as I preach what I believe you've led me to preach tonight, that you'd please fill me afresh and anew with thy spirit, uh, lead and direct my thoughts and my words, and may I only say the things tonight that are pleasing to thee. And Father, from this passage, from the stories, the things we're reading of David here in 2 Samuel 5, I pray that you'd give us understanding. Uh, Lord, lead and direct this evening. We commit the service to thee. Ask your blessing upon the message. We do pray if someone's lost here tonight without Christ, that tonight they'd get saved. And for the believer, that we would understand these truths about the Lord Jesus Christ that we see here in David. And so I pray you'd help me tonight, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. If you were to describe the life of David after the death of Saul, of the king, in 1 Samuel 31, all the way to here in 2 Samuel chapter 5, I believe you could describe it with one word, and that is the word turmoil, trouble. You ever been there? Your life in turmoil? You'd think that after being anointed king roughly 10 years ago and, uh, uh, and after 10 years of fleeing for his life and all of the things that we've seen uh, since we begin this, began this series on the life of David uh, as he li lived the life of a fugitive running from Saul uh, and trying to find a place to go. You, you'd, think that, you'd think that once that King Saul died that David would now finally take his God-given rightful place on the throne of Israel and all would be well. But it wasn't. Right. You know, in a picture-perfect world, if Hollywood were to write this, David would have been brought before the entire nation of Israel. They would have anointed him as this great hero of the people. And they would all live happily ever after. And that's not it, is it? David faced and would continue to face turmoil. Israel became a great battleground for power. You know, any time the leader leaves or the leader dies, that's what happens. Who is going to rule? Who are we going to submit to? After Saul's death, it was only the tribe of Judah that recognized David as their king. That was it in 2 Samuel chapter 2 and verse 4. You'd think everybody would have done it, but they didn't. Then you have uh, uh, Abner, who was Saul's uh, captain of the host, uh, who decides, I'm not going to follow David. We know why. He didn't impress David with his actions. And so what did he do? Instead of submitting to God's choice in, in King David, he went to Saul's only living son uh, named Ishbosheth, uh, and he took him and he rallied everybody else in the nation, uh, uh, the other tribes, uh, uh, and they he took this 40-year-old man, this uh, weak man, uh, and made him their king. That's what he did. And for the next seven and a half years, there would be, as chapter 3 and verse 1 says, long war between the house of David and the house of Saul. 
On one side, you'd see the house of Saul, King Saul, with Ishbosheth, uh, and he would have those 10 or 11, 10 tribes following him. Uh, they would have their headquarters on the, on the east side of the Jordan River, River in a place called Mahanam. Uh, there, we see that in chapter 2 and verse 8. And on the other side of the Jordan River, you find David with his one tribe of Judah. They would have their headquarters in Hebron, some 20 miles south of Jerusalem on the west side of the Jordan River. And for, for all those years, they would be constantly fighting. Not only that, but the Philistines had just won. If you remember, this was the reason that Saul died and Jonathan died. Uh, the Philistines would have uh, taken control of much of the land of Israel. It was turmoil trouble. During this seven and a half year struggle, a lot of things happen. I mean, we read from chapters two to chapter four of three major events. Number one is this, Abner, uh, Saul's uh, uh, captain, uh, now Ishbosheth's captain, uh, he kills Joab's brother, Ashiel. Abner and his men come over, they cross the Jordan River, and they have a battle there against Joab's men. There's this skirmish that takes place, and 19 of, uh, uh, of Joab's men die, and 360 of Abner's men die. But most important during this skirmish, skirmish Abner slays Joab's brother, Ashiel in an act of self-defense uh, before the two sides return to their base. By the way, that makes Joab hot. He's angry. A second, Abner is then murdered by Joab. We read of that in chapter 3 and verses 22 through 30. Abner and Ishbosheth have a falling out. Because Abner went into Saul's concubines. Uh, and so again, uh, Joab gets wind that Abner's trying to side up with David. Abner and David have a meeting. It appears that David's going to accept Abner as kind of defecting from Ishbosheth. Uh, Joab finds out, and what does he do? He calls Abner to Hebron. He says he wants to talk to him. And as they meet there, David not knowing what's going on, uh, Abner, um, Joab takes a sword and he shoves it under his ribs and kills him. Abner's now dead. And more turmoil now still in these seven and a half years. Uh, uh, the next thing is Ishbosheth is now murdered after the death of Abner. Now everything's falling apart in Israel. Two of Saul's men, Bayana and Rechab, we read of this in chapter 4, verses 1 through 12. In an attempt to gain favor with David, what do they do? They decide to slay Ishbosheth. They know there's no hope when it's now that Abner's gone. And so they figure, you know, let's gain favor with David. And so they kill Ishbosheth. They cut off his head, just like David did with Goliath. And they pick up his head and they bring it to David and said, look what we did. No more trouble here. Uh, your enemy's done now. He's gone. Abner's gone. Ishbosheth is gone. And as chapter 4 ends, we find when David finds out about this, he's not happy. And he has those two men executed, killed for what they did. And then that leads us to chapter 5. Seven and a half years of turmoil. Here comes David now, uh, and we read after all of that uh, uh, in chapter 5 in verse 1, uh, Then came all the tribes of Israel to David unto Hebron, and spake, saying, Behold, we are thy bone and thy flesh. Uh, and we know what happens in verse 3. So all the elders uh, of Israel uh, came to the king to Hebron. And so here they come, uh, uh, those that followed Ishbosheth, those that were uh, followed Abner. Uh, now Abner's dead, Ishbosheth is dead. Uh, uh, it's a mess. And so what do they do? They realize David's going to be our king. And so they go there to Hebron. And what do they do? We read uh, uh, that they make a league. Uh, David makes a league with them in Hebron. And they anointed David king Amen. over Israel. Tonight I want to preach on this subject. The enthroning of a king. Amen. The enthroning of a king. 
Have you ever thought of it this way? That in God's eyes, David had already been king for some time? I mean, not just for the past seven and a half years when he had come to Hebron and Judah there, but arguably we could say for the past 17 years, uh, the moment that uh, uh, Samuel the prophet uh, poured, poured that anointing oil uh, and anointed him as king, uh, uh, that in the eyes and the mind of God, uh, that's when David really became the king. Amen. But now... Here, some 17 years later, the nation of Israel is finally recognizing him as their king. They're finally giving David uh, his rightful place uh, in the nation. And tonight, I'd like to make a spiritual application here. And I hope you don't mind me taking a little bit of liberty to do this. Between what happened to David when he was enthroned a king, as we read these incidents in chapter 5, to what happens to me and you when we as believers make Jesus Christ the king of our lives. Amen. When we enthrone him as our king. We're going to find some wonderful parallels here about what happened to David when he was made king to what happens to us. When we enthrone Jesus as our Amen. king. Tonight I want to give you, I'm going to say it, and I mean it, five things, I'll be fast, that we, oh, oh, who groaned? That was my wife, I think, amen? All right, I'll give you five, I'll give her three, amen, that we see that happen. Notice number one, if you would, please, the crowning of David. The crowning of David. Look at verse 3 again. We'll read it here for a moment. And so all the elders of Israel came to Hebron, and, and, and King David made a league with them in Hebron before the Lord. And they anointed David king over Israel. As I said a few moments ago, although David was recognized by God as Israel's king 17 years ago, he was not recognized by God's people yet as king. As a matter of fact, it took 10 years before Judah would recognize it. Then it would take another seven and a half years for the rest of God's people to recognize him. He is our king. Right. But finally, what did they do? We find here in 2 Samuel 5, 3, finally, they take David and they give him his rightful place in their lives. Amen. He is now crowned as king. Amen. You know, there's a wonderful comparison here between David and the Lord Jesus Christ in our lives. I hope you know tonight, I think all of us should at least know this, that Jesus Christ is Lord. Lord. Jesus Christ is the king. He is the king of kings and he is the Lord of lords. 1 Timothy 6, 15, which in his times he shall show who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Psalm 136 and verse 3, O give thanks to the Lord of lords, for his mercy endureth forever. Revelation 19, 16, and he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, here it is, King of kings and Lord of lords. So the question tonight is not, is Jesus Christ the Lord? The question is this, is he your Lord? Is he the Lord of your life? You know, there's somebody on the throne of your life and my life. And I want to ask tonight, who is it? Most of the time, it's me. We like to be on the throne. I like to make my own decisions. I like to go my own way. But that's not the way it's supposed to be as a believer. Who is on the throne of your life? You see, being when, when we say being our king, when Jesus Christ is the Lord of our lives, here's what it means. We place ourselves under his authority. Amen. 
We are totally submitted to his rule. We've given him control, watch this, over every area of our lives. We say to him, Lord, whatever you want, I'll do. Whatever you say, I'll obey. If there's something I'm doing wrong, I'll change it. I won't make excuses. I'll change it. Amen. Because you are my king. You see, all of us after salvation need to make this decision. Who's going to rule our lives? He is the king. David was the king for years, but they didn't recognize it. Now they finally are. Can I ask you something? Have you recognized it? Amen. You and I, we can go years as a believer and not recognize him as our king. We can say he's the king, and we can say, I know he's the king, but does he rule over your life and mine? Have you gotten to the place of Romans 12, 1 and 2, where you've presented your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service? That means if he says, I want you to do this, I'll do it. If he says, I want you to go there, I'll do it. That's because he is the Lord of our lives. Have you crowned him as your king tonight? You know, one of the great hymns of the faith is the hymn, All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name. I love that hymn, I do. It's been called often the national anthem of Christendom. I don't particularly like that word, but that's what it's called. And the second verse reads this, Ye chosen seed of Israel's race, ye ransomed from the fall, hail him who saves you by his grace, watch this, and crown him Lord of all. Hail him who saves you by his grace, and crown him Lord of all. Of all. That means we take the throne, uh, the crown off of our head and we place it on his, on his. We say, I am not the ruler of my life, Lord, you are. That means he's the Lord of my time. He's the Lord of my talent. He's the Lord of my treasures. He's the Lord of my family. He's the Lord of my decisions. He's the Lord of everything in our lives. But you know, much like David here, the Lord never forces himself on the throne of your life, like I talked about this morning uh, in a different way. We must place him there. We must relinquish the control to him. And I want to ask you tonight, have you crowned him the Lord of your life? So we see the first parallel is this, the crowning of David. Uh, secondly, I want you to notice the conquering of Zion. Notice what happens when David was crowned. Uh, again, we see that in verses 1 through 5. But then in verse 6, would you look at it with me? And the king and his men went to Jerusalem unto the Jebusites, the inhabitants of the land, which spake unto David, saying, Except thou take away the blind and the lame, thou shalt not come in hither, thinking David cannot come in hither. Nevertheless, David took the stronghold of Zion. The same is the city of David. Would you please notice what we find here in verse 7. We read that David, watch this, the moment he's crowned, he takes the stronghold of Zion. Do you know there were certain places in the land of Israel that the Israelites could not seem to get victory over? I mean, under the leadership of Joshua, they were supposed to go in, and they each had their allotted place, and what were they supposed to do? They were supposed to drive out the inhabitants of the land, and we know in the book of Judges, in chapter 2, that they did not do that. They, they allowed them to stay, and the enemy had certain uh, strongholds uh, there in the land, and do you know that one of those places was the city of Jerusalem? Uh, the Jebusites were there, Joshua 15, 63. As for the Jebusites, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the children of Judah could not drive them out. And imagine there from the days of uh, Joshua, uh, they couldn't drive them out. All through the days of all the judges, over 400 years, there they were in the land. They were like uh, thorns in their sides. Uh, they could not get rid of them. Uh, and for centuries, this city of Jerusalem, uh, Zion, uh, uh, the city of Jebus, J-E-B-U-S, was inhabited by the Jebusites. It was a Canaanite stronghold, a place that the children of Israel just could not defeat, could not get victory over until now. Amen. Now, David's the king, and he immediately takes the stronghold the of Zion. 
You know that one of the first evidences that Jesus Christ is enthroned in our lives is he immediately gives us victory over the strongholds in our lives. You know, all of us struggle at one time or another with sin. I talked about that a little bit this morning. But you know, there are certain sins, and they're all different for each of us, that seem to have strongholds uh, in our lives. I mean, it's like sins that we cannot seem to get victory over. Sins that we feel like uh, we just struggle with over and over, uh, time and time again. For some, it may be alcohol. For some, it may be uh, the way you speak, maybe a uh, foul language, maybe it's a sin of the tongue, maybe it's an anger issue. Uh, you name it, you fill in the blank. But things that over the years uh, have brought you and me great frustrations uh, and that have uh, baffled our efforts and mocked our struggles uh, and brought us great shame and embarrassment again and again. Uh, and understand that uh, these are the strongholds in our lives. You know, many times as believers, we get the idea that all we need to do is just try a little harder. That, you know, the answer to that, how do I get victory? Well, uh, just come to the altar and pray about it again. Well, that may be the beginning, but it's not just that. We have the idea, just give it a little bit more effort. Uh, can I submit to you tonight that that's not the answer at all? Do you know what the problem is? I'll tell you what it is. Uh, do you know why we struggle with that? Because it's in that area of our life that we haven't given Jesus Christ the kingship over. We haven't. We must allow him to be on the throne of our lives because when he is on the throne, we can, we can, I say it again, we can conquer any stronghold in our lives. The truth of the matter is, some of you have given up on it. And so I'm just going to accept that as a, as a way of life for me. No, 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 don't do that. Make Jesus Christ the king in that area of your life. And he'll defeat that stronghold. You may have heard of Mel Trotter. Mel Trotter was born in 1870. He died at the age of 70 in 1940. Mel Trotter was, a, as a lost man, he was a bartender. They said that he drank more than he served. That's the kind of guy he was. He was an alcoholic. He was married. He, he got married to a woman who didn't realize how bad of an alcoholic he was. And uh, for years, the, their lives were a mess. They had a, they had a child together. And he would uh, do what happens in the lives of anyone that's caught up in that type of sin or other types of sins like that. Uh, he lost job after job. He would leave the house. He would be gone for weeks on end. And, and at one particular time, he's going these drunken binges. That's what he did. And at one particular time, when he left for weeks, when he he came out back he found out something that his two and a half year little boy died and he wasn't there and he was so hurt and so upset about that and so broken about that but he just could not get a get a hold of this alcohol problem and, and uh, they, it said that he even at the funeral when he showed up uh, he grabbed the shoes off of his boy in the in the coffin in the casket there and he ended up selling them to get another drink it was unbelievable he went on another binge. He found himself in the city of Chicago and he roamed into the Pacific Garden Mission one night and he heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Mel Trotter got saved. He trusted Christ as Savior. And he didn't waste any time. He not only got saved, but he placed Jesus Christ as the king of his life. He made him the Lord of lords in his life. And the Lord gave him victory immediately when he did that over that stronghold in his life. For the next 40 years, he would end up founding the Grand, Grand Rapids, Michigan City Rescue Mission. And he'd serve the Lord with the rest, for the rest of his life for 40 years. Amen. Praise the Lord. You say, how did he get victory over that stronghold? It wasn't about just picking himself up by the bootstraps. Right. It wasn't because he finally just said, well, I'm just going to try harder. What he did was he gave Jesus Christ the kingship in his life. He made right. him the king. Not just see all him as a king, and rec but recognize him. He is the Lord over every area of my life. Amen. You know, Christ's enthronement has delivered so many people. The drug addict, the habitual smoker, the man who can't control his tongue. The moment we give him his rightful place, 
He gives us victory over that stronghold. So we see, number one, the crowning of David. Number two, we see the conquering of Zion. Then we see another thing. Notice we see something else that happens as we enthrone Christ. And that is this, the continuing growth. Look at verse 10. And David went on and grew great. And the Lord God uh, of hosts was with him. You know, the next result of David being on the throne uh, was that his kingdom grew and increased. Amen. And it's the same with us. When the Lord Jesus Christ is on the throne, that's what happens. You know, the Lord desires for every believer to always be growing. Amen. You, you know, sometimes we get to a place where we think, well, I guess I'm done growing. Uh, don't get to that place. We've never arrived again. We're always growing. We're always trying or letting the Lord work in our lives to be more like the Lord Jesus Christ. 2 Peter 3.18 But grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. But understand what has to happen. Don't miss it here. In order to do this, in order for you and me to grow, the Lord must continually conquer areas of our life that are not surrendered to Him. You see, in reality, the Christian life is a succession of coronations. By that I mean it is a series of one coronation after another, after another, after another. Every step of faith and obedience is followed by another demand for Christ to occupy another area of our lives. And he keeps doing this until he reigns over every area. Sometimes he gets to the place where we're, we're, we're kind of holding back on something. We don't want him to have that area. But you know, he wants to continue to do this. Philippians 1.6, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. You see, what happens is this, is that we give him the crown uh, to our hearts and to our lives. And then he challenges us in another area uh, that we see he needs to crown here. So we crown him again. Okay, Lord, you are the king over my finances then. Okay, Lord, you are the king over my tongue. Here it is. Lord, you're the king uh, over this. You're the king over my family. You're the king over my life. Whatever you want me to do, if you call me to the mission field, if you call me wherever, just serving through my local church, if you want me to teach a Sunday school class, Lord, you can have that as well. Amen. And understand, every one of those uh, confrontations, if you will, uh, is that very thing. Uh, we tend to fight uh, over every piece of ground uh, that the Lord is trying to conquer. And at any time, any point in our life, we resist His reign. You know that that moment, God will put us on the shelf. Lord have mercy. And He won't use us anymore. When we shut it down, when we say, Lord, I'll, I've given you this area, but I'm not giving you this area. I'm not letting you have control over my finances. I'm not letting you have control over where I go or what I do. I want to decide that. The moment we put the brakes on, understand what happens. God puts the brakes on us. He places us on a shelf. That means continually challenge after challenge, hearing, preaching, and reading the Word of God and learning what God wants. Uh, he's trying to conquer every piece of ground. And when Jesus Christ is on the throne, there will be a continual growth uh, of crowning Him again and again and again and again, moving forward till He's conquered it all. You know, it's possible to be preaching sermons and teaching Sunday school lessons using the same pious language, singing the same words of the hymn, but our effectiveness is gone because we've shut down some area of our life that we don't allow him to have reign over. You see, when Christ is on the throne, there will be continuing growth. So we see, number one, the crowning of David. Number two, the conquering of Zion. Number three, the continuing growth. By the way, let me just throw this in, because I kind of skipped over it. You probably noticed it. David had a lot of growing to do. Uh, if you'll notice, I didn't read verses 13 through 16. But David's up to his old ways again here. Notice David took him more concubines and wives out of Jerusalem after he was come from Hebron. and names it. These be the names in verse 14 that were born and so forth. Uh, here he goes. God just throws at it. You know what that's showing us here? David's on the throne, but he hasn't arrived yet. There's still more areas to conquer in David's life. 
And God wants to do that with me and you as well. Amen. So again, we see the crowning of David, the conquering of Zion, the continuing growth. But then fourthly, notice the counterattack of the enemy. So David's on the throne, right? And he's conquering the strongholds. Things are going well. And he's continuing to grow. His kingdom is expanding. What happens? Notice in verse 17. But when the Philistines heard that they had anointed David king over Israel, all the Philistines uh, came up to seek David. And David heard of it and went down to the hold. What does that mean? Oh, well, I guess that means that they're kind of happy David's on the throne. No. Well, they're going up to seek him. Are they going to con congratulate him? They're going to throw him a party? Welcome, well, welcome to the throne, David. We love you. No, they wanted to fight him. Again, notice verse 18. The, the Philistines also came and spread themselves. Notice in the valley of Rephaim. Here's what I mean by this, what I'm trying to apply here. That David's enthronement uh, uh, was immediately challenged by the enemy. They spread themselves in the valley of Rephaim. By the way, you know where that is? That's right there next to Jerusalem. You see, what they wanted to do was they, was they wanted to recapture that stronghold. The enemy wasn't going to sit back. And by the way, it's the same with you and I as believers. Understand something, if you, if you give the Lord uh, the crown in an area of your life and you continue to grow and crown him uh, your king over this and over that, understand something, the enemy is not going to sit back and do nothing. Right. He is going to oppose you the moment that Christ truly becomes your Lord and you submit to his kingship. Expect an all-out massive counterattack from the powers of evil. We see it all the time. Commentator Alan Redpath said this, If you have crowned Jesus Christ as Lord, you're in for a life of constant warfare. He said, The devil didn't have to bother too much about you before, but if you determine to live for him, uh, uh, you are a menace to the powers of darkness. You are now a threat uh, uh, to the devil's work. Uh, and we see this all the time. I can't tell you how many times we've seen a person that was struggling with either drugs or alcohol and they get saved uh, and they choose to start living for God uh, and coming to church and trying to do the right thing. Uh, and what happens so often is their so-called friends, uh, their druggy friends, won't leave them alone. They call and call and call and try to draw them back uh, into that lifestyle. I want to say, why don't you just leave them alone? Because the enemy won't stand for it. They won't with me or you. When a young girl ends a wrong relationship with a young man, what happens? That young man just keeps calling and calling and calling and bothering and bothering. My point is this. The enemy is persistent. And when you and I crown the Lord Jesus Christ as our king, when he is enthroned uh, uh, in our lives, uh, understand again, uh, there's going to be a counterattack of the enemy. He's not going to lie down and play dead and let you grow and move forward for God and win souls for the kingdom and make a difference for God in this world. He won't lay back and do nothing. Right. He's going to attack. But thank God, 1 John 4, 4 says this, Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Amen. Jesus said in John 16, 33, These things I have spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, Christ says. I have overcome the world. Amen. The Lord will be with us. But when he's on the throne... We can have victory over the enemy, but you better get ready, buckle down, and expect a counterattack. There's one last thing we see, not only the crowning of David and the conquering of Zion, the continual growth and the counterattack, we see lastly the communion with God. Notice what happens when David is the king. Notice we read in verse 18, after the Philistines come up and spread themselves in the valley of Rephaim. Notice we read, David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go up to the Philistines? David was in close communion with God. We know that God tells him to go. Then if you look down at verse 22, by the way, David goes and he wins the battle. And of course, it, it happened, there's another attack here in verse 22. And the Philistines came up yet again and spread themselves in the valley of Rephaim. Boy, they're persistent, aren't they? 
And when David inquired of the Lord, he said, Thou shalt not go up. So notice what I'm saying here was that when David was enthroned, he was in communion with God. And when the enemy came to attack, David goes right to his knees. He not only inquired of God, but he heard God's voice. And when God spoke to him, he followed God's directive. You see, that's the result of the king being on the throne. First time he says go up. Second time he says don't go up. And each time David responds in obedience. Amen. Now, I'm not trying to be spooky here when I say what I'm going to say here. But I think you know what I mean. When was the last time you heard the voice of God? Amen. That's good. When was the last time you prayed and asked God for direction? And you distinctly, and I'm not talking about necessarily audible. I'm not talking about that. But in your heart of her hearts, you heard God telling you to do something. Amen. And then when was the last time you responded to the voice of God? When he said something and you heard it and you did what he said. You know, Jesus said in John 10, 27, My sheep hear my voice Amen. and I know them and they follow me. Amen. Now, if you're looking at me tonight thinking, what in the world is he talking about? You know what that's an evidence of? He's not on the throne of your life. Why would he keep talking to us when we don't listen? That's good. Amen. He's not going to do that. Amen. He wants us to place him in his proper place on the throne. You see, what we say is, Lord, if you tell me to do something, I'll think about it, and if I, if I feel like I should do it, I'll do it. That's not how it works. He wants us to first say, Lord, you are the king. Whatever you tell me to do, I'm going to do. And when he sees that uh, and he hears that and sees it in our hearts uh, and knows that's what we mean, what does he do? Then he starts talking to us about Amen. some direction Praise in life. You see, when Christ is on the throne of our lives, understand this, this characteristic here. There's communion with the Lord. the Lord. He speaks to us and we hear him. Tonight I want to ask you this question as we think of the enthronement of the king. Who's on the throne of your life? Who is it? Is the Lord on the throne? Is he truly on the throne? Have you really, you know, a lot of times, a lot of times we say this, well, he's my co-pilot. <laughs> no, no, no. You got it wrong. Right. He's a pilot. Right. We're the passenger. Right. He tells us where we're going. Right. We don't tell him. Amen. We don't struggle for the controls of the, you know, the plane there. And so I'm going to go this. That's, that's how we treat him, though, like a co-pilot. He doesn't want that. Right. He wants to have enthronement over every area Glory of our lives. Amen. Can I ask you tonight, is there an area in your life that you haven't given to him? Control? Your time? Good. Treasure? Your talent? What you want to do? I got news for you, and I hope this doesn't come across mean. I don't mean to, but it doesn't matter what you want to do. Amen. It really doesn't. I, I don't think he really cares what you want to do, honestly. Right. Because he wants you to do what he wants you to do. Praise but it's not going to happen until he's on the throne. Amen. When he's on the throne, he will enable you to conquer your strongholds. When he's on the throne, you will be continually growing, coronating him time after time again. Again, When he's on the throne, yes, you're going to experience a counterattack, uh, but he'll never leave us nor forsake us. And when he's on the throne, you will be in communion with him, and you will be easily hearing his voice when he Amen. speaks to you, when the king is on the throne. Amen. Let's pray together.